Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. As was the case with the last two videos, there's going to be a lot to do before we get to this dungeon. So let's hop into it. Last time, we completed the Goron Mines and found the second Fused Shadow. Now only one remains. The Light Spirit Elden tells us to head north to the Laneru province in order to find it as well as find the one we seek. Before leaving Kakariko, make sure to stop at the bomb shop to get yourself a bomb bag and, well, Bombs. We can cross the field and Elden Bridge, which gets stolen, blow up these rocks, and we'll find the Barrier of Twilight. As usual, Midna pulls us through and we'll transform into wolf form. We'll find a discarded bag, which belonged to Ilya, and learn her scent. Following the trail of her scent strings us through the northern sections of Hyrule and into Castletown, where we'll actually find Ilya in this bar tending to a wounded Zora. In the back room of the bar are a handful of soldiers who are examining a map which shows us the location of the spirit spring at Lake Hylia. We can head towards the lake and we'll find ourselves at the Great Bridge of Hylia. Some baddies will set the bridge ablaze so we'll need to jump off the side and down into the lake below. This should all feel familiar to any Ocarina of Time players. We'll find that the lake has mostly dried up much to the concern of many of the Zoras who can't even head up the Zora River to return home. Because the lake is dried up, that also means the spirit spring is inaccessible. We'll encounter this shadow Bulblin, who calls upon a massive shadow Kargarok, which he rides. We'll have to battle this duo, and once the shadow Bulblin is defeated, Midna will mount the beast and take control of it. This allows us to fly up the Zora River, and when we reach the top, we'll be able to walk over to Zora's domain, which is completely frozen over. Deja vu. Oh, side note, don't forget this Howling Stone here in Upper Zora's River. There's some platforming, but at the top of Zora's domain, we'll battle some Shadow Beasts, and Midna will notice something below the ice. It's the Zoras, trapped and frozen. We'll have to thaw them out, which we can do by warping over to Death Mountain, grabbing this huge volcanic rock, which we actually saw earlier, and dropping it right into the sheet of ice. This frees the Zoras and restores the flow of water out from Zora's domain. We'll now meet the spirit of Rutella, the Zora Queen, who thanks us for freeing her people and asks a favor of us. She requests we find and rescue her son who was sent to Hyrule Castle, and if we do so, she'll reward us with the ability to swim freely like a Zora. We can ride the current down the river all the way to Lake Hylia, and we'll end up right at the Spirit Spring where we can talk to the Light Spirit Laneru and get the Vessel of Light. You know the drill by now, it's bug hunting time. However, this time Time round, once we found all these shadow insects, we'll actually come up one tier of light short. Then Midna will point out that it appears suddenly as a blip on your map. If we return to that spot at the lake, we'll actually find that this is no ordinary shadow insect. It's actually a surprise boss fight. This is the Twilit Bloat, and he's as ugly as his name implies. Thankfully, he isn't the toughest boss to take down, but he is one of the grossest. Wait until his protective barrier is gone, then strike at him. After a few attacks, he'll be stunned and drop into the water belly up. Hop onto him and charge an attack with dark energy the same way we've been defeating shadow beasts, and this will finish him off. With the final tier of light collected, the twilight will be removed from this province and the light spirit restored. Laneru will tell us that the fused shadow is in the lake bed temple at the bottom of Lake Hylia, but also warns us of its dark power and tells us a bit of history, in particular about the ancient interloper war. So we now know where the fused shadow is, but we can't actually swim to the bottom of the lake yet. But Midna will remind us that Rutella promised us a swimming ability if we rescue her son. Now we can return to Castletown with a little help. Don't forget to stop by here to meet the Hero's Shade and learn a new hidden skill, the Backslice. Now in town we'll find Rutella's son Raylus is that Zora child that Ilya was tending to. However, when you show up, Ilya doesn't recognize Link because she's lost her memories. Ilya and Telma plan to bring Raylus to Kakariko since Renato can better care for him. However, the soldiers, who initially offer to escort them, are all cowards and run off at the mention of monsters, so you take their place. Now we'll have a horseback battle segment turned escort mission. It's pretty 
pretty fun. We'll have to battle King Bulblin on the Bridge of Hylia, this time using our bow, since he's got these huge shields. And then we'll escort Telma's carriage across Hyrule Field, warding off the attacking Bulblins. Once we reach Kakariko, Telma tells us that she's part of a freedom fighter group in Hyrule, and tells you to return to her bar later, and hey, Link, eyes up here buddy. Rutella will return, and she guides us to a Zora grave in the Kakariko graveyard, where we'll find the Zora armor. This replaces the blue tunic from Ocarina of Time, but in addition to the underwater breathing, we can now also swim. Also make sure to stop back at the bomb shop to buy water bombs, which as the name implies, are bombs that we can use in the water. We can make a shortcut in the graveyard that takes us back to Lake Hylia, and we can finally swim down to the bottom of the lake, blow up this rock, and swim into the dungeon. Welcome to the Lake Bed Temple. Not unlike Ocarina of Time's Water Temple, the Lake Bed Temple is often regarded as one of the most difficult and confusing dungeons in the series. And I think I know why. The Forest Temple and Goron Mines alike have done a pretty great job of making the navigation rather streamlined. This works well for these dungeons and fits their themes, and I wasn't shy about praising them in their own dedicated videos. Those two dungeons also had friendly NPCs in Side, who would guide you by either literally beckoning you to follow them, or just by providing some hints. The layouts of those dungeons would often loop back on themselves, but retained a clear sense of direction. However, in the Lakebed Temple, this is where the game lets go of your hand. There's no NPCs to handhold you, and this dungeon is far more obtuse with its general sense of direction. For example, the boss room is dead center in the dungeon, not at the opposite end of where you came in. The dungeon also has a far less understandable map. The Forest Temple kept to a simple, single floor. The Goron Mines had two floors, but only one room actually overlapped, so it may as well have been a single floor as well. Here, there are a whopping six floors! And as was the case back in Wind Waker's Forbidden Woods, often the map doesn't show how the rooms connect, or it segments off sections needlessly. Overall, the scope of the dungeon is just much much greater than those that came before them in this game. But you know what? I love it. The dungeon has its reputation of being difficult, but if you struggle with this temple, I would urge you to rethink your approach to the dungeon in general. Because this place doesn't rely on the progression structure that the last two dungeons adhered to. Though all three dungeons have had a prominent central room, they have for the most part had very segmented challenges. The forest temple had you rescuing monkeys dotted around the the map, and the mines were just a large loop requiring you to assemble the boss key. But overall, your actions didn't very often impact anything outside of the room you were in, or for that matter, the dungeon as a whole. Each puzzle in those two dungeons was kept to a single room. With this place, rather than a series of rooms with individual puzzles, the dungeon as a whole is one larger puzzle. Your actions in one room impact other rooms, and so to me, there's a very clear sense of cause and effect in the dungeon's puzzles, forcing you to not just keep the room at hand in mind, but be mindful as well of the bigger picture. While the Lakebed Temple is most often compared to Ocarina of Time's Water Temple, and at a glance it's easy to see why, its structure overall is far more like a marriage of ideas between the Water Temple and Great Bay Temple from Majora's Mask. Like Great Bay, we need to activate the water flow from a couple of locations, which affects a 
water current in the main central room. And we can change a mechanism in the central room to direct the water flow. Though rather than a giant turbine causing the current to change, we have this huge rotating staircase. Like Ocarina of Time's water temple, doing so will raise the water level in said central room. This is important for two reasons. One, in order to reach the dungeon boss in that central room, the water level has to be raised all the way. And two, in order to access certain areas, we need to have water flowing to turn these large water wheels that block those paths. Just keeping that second point in mind and understanding the cause and effect of the water flow in this dungeon is going to go a long way to making your time here easier, and it's going to make that first point of reaching the boss door pretty much take care of itself. The temple's architecture is a visual treat. It seems to be built into naturally formed caves under the lake with huge stalactites and stalagmites, but decorated with distinctly Zora architecture. Most notably, the swaths of colorful flagstone used all over the place, which really sets this temple apart. And the ornate mosaic-like tiles scattered among the temple's floors and walls just add to the sense of this being, well, a temple. I particularly adore the huge chandelier in the central room, which looks to me like it was built with luminous stones the same way they're used in Zora's domain in Breath of the Wild. The Zora also seem to have leaned into some fairly natural inspirations while building this place. Fencing appears to be made of coral, overgrowth resembling seaweed covers huge sections of walls and ceilings, and the central room's huge rotating staircase seems to sit atop a giant shell. We can also find sculptures depicting large fish, symbols with images of shells, fins, and swirling aquatic motifs, and, as you'd expect, the Zora crest on most of the doors. A neat detail is that the doors have an open section at the bottom that allows water to flow through to the other rooms. The water flow also powers some impressive mechanisms in the dungeon, which starkly contrast the temple themes with these huge industrial-like gears and water wheels. Though these are far more ornate than the machines found in Goron Mine, they are equally as impressive in scope. Though many of the rooms seem to be in a pretty heavy state of disrepair, walkways have crumbled, stairs destroyed, and walls hollowed out, and some sections have almost entirely given way to their more cavernous roots while monsters have moved in. The dungeon's music is entirely underrated. Certainly, while playing, many would write it off as boring ambience, but if you give it a good, proper listening, you'll realize that there is a lot going on under the hood with this track. First, the track opens with what sounds to me like a string of notes played on a sitar, which, like most of this track's instrumentation, feels to me like a deliberate callback to the music from Ocarina of Time's Water Temple. There's a simple melody, layers of chanting choir voices, and what almost sounds like dripping water. The way these layers fade in and out perfectly fits the dungeon's feeling of a once sacred place left in desolation and disrepair. And if you listen to these two water temple themes side by side, it almost feels like this track is, in a sense, a true sequel. A tragic and decayed companion piece to the water temple's more robust and zen atmosphere. A shadow. And this idea makes sense to me, since it's always been my own headcanon that the Lakebed Temple and Water Temple are one and the same, but in different eras, both being located at the bottom of Lake Hylia, but that's never confirmed. Alright, let's talk about the progression. The dungeon entrance is this underwater tunnel that we'll need to swim through. We'll be introduced to a couple of underwater enemies, such as these blade shells and Bari. We'll swim up and emerge into this foyer room, where we'll also meet this game's version of Choo Choo's. By the way, you can scoop up that red jelly and drink it to restore hearts if you need. The door is gated shut, but there's a switch here which you can jump to and pull down to open the gate. Heading through the door, we'll enter the first hallway room. 
the ramp up to the next door is collapsed, but the game and Midna will give us a hint as this stalactite falls from the ceiling, and Midna suggests knocking the others down, which we can do by using bomb arrows. We'll encounter these Helmosaurs, who we can defeat by striking from behind, and use these fallen rocks to climb to the next door. There's a short bridge here spanning over this circle of water, where we'll meet this game's version of Lazalfos, and we'll emerge from the southern door into the main central room. This central room seems to be the main source of confusion for this dungeon. There are a handful of these switches to pull that will change the direction of the rotating staircase in the middle of the room. There's eight of these switches in total, one in each cardinal direction on both floors, though about half are broken and not usable at the moment. There's also six doors in this room, the southern door that we just entered through, which is visually distinct from the rest, and a door on the eastern and western ends of the room on both floors. And finally, the boss door dead center in the room under the rotating staircase. I think a lot of this confusion, as was the case with Ocarina of Time's Water Temple, is the sheer volume of options with no clear indication of just where to start. But in truth, the game actually does a subtle but clever job of pointing you in the right direction. To start with, those doors in this room are actually color-coded as either blue or red. Also in this central room, there are a handful of these coral fences which prevent you from exploring the room fully at this time. So with these sections gated off, our only option is to head down the stairs to the lower floor of the room. Once down here, you'll find only one door accessible thanks to these coral barriers, that being the lower western door, which is blue. However, if we head through there, you'll find the bridge impassable thanks to this huge water wheel, which is inactive. So instead, you'll need to tread around the central room and grab onto one of these levers to pull it down, which rotates the staircase. We can head up and we'll find the upper western room has the same issue as its lower counterpart, being impassable. So both blue doors on the west side are out. That just leaves the eastern door doors, which are color-coded as red. The upper eastern door is actually locked, and we don't have a small key, so that leaves us with one single option in this room, the lower eastern door. To reach it, line yourself up with the upper western door, and pull the switch to rotate the stairs. Just a side note while we're here, there's a pot in this central room on the upper floor, with Uku, again! And we'll find a treasure chest just off from that lower eastern door, which contains the dungeon map. If we open the map here, it looks more complicated than it is, but in truth, all you need to know are four distinct landmarks. The entrance, the central room here, and the two farthest rooms in either direction, east and west. Everything else is just filler. Alright, with that idea in your head, and a bit of process of elimination in the works, let's head through the red door and down that eastern hallway. We'll emerge into this room with a huge gear and hanging platforms. Currently, the water is lowered, and the mechanism are not active, so there isn't too much to do here yet aside from taking the layout. But on the other end of the room, we can knock off this stalactite to create a platform so we can reach this chest and grab ourselves a small key. Perfect. This is the very key we needed to unlock the door upstairs in the central room. So let's simply backtrack there. You don't even need to rotate the stairs, just head to the upper floor and circle around the side of the room. Then spend that key to unlock the upper red door and head down the hall. We'll find ourselves in this hallway that branches in either direction and actually wraps around an interior room. The path to the right is gated off, so naturally head left instead. We can knock the rocks from the ceiling again to create a platform, climb these vines, pull the switch, which opens the gate so we don't have to climb again, and use a bomb to destroy the boulder blocking the hall. There's a door that goes into the interior room, but there isn't much to do there yet, so instead head into the far this door. We'll now be in the easternmost room. We'll meet a new enemy called a Chew Worm, who hides in this protective bubble. You can use a bomb arrow to burst his bubble, <laughs> and defeat him. We'll find a locked door here, and since
since we don't have a key, we can head through the other side door, which takes us into another section of the exterior hallway from before, where we'll find a chest with that key we needed. The way back is on a ledge out of reach, however, so we'll need to cut through the interior room and back to the other end of the hallway where we had previously gone in. Now heading back and through that locked door, we'll find this room with this massive spiraling ramp. Make your way up and we'll find a lever to pull at the top which opens the water flow into this room. This will fill the pool at the bottom and cause the ramp to act like a sort of water slide. Whee! There's another switch at the bottom to pull open this shutter, which allows the water to flow down the grooves in the floor and through the other rooms. We can see it going through those gaps in the door and down the hallway, also powering these huge water wheels. If we head into the interior room, we'll also see the huge gears are now turning as well, thanks to the water wheels. This huge gear is in fact the same one we saw the bottom of downstairs before, and these rooms are connected so we can actually drop down down into that lower room from here. With that gear turning, we can now ride these platforms that are circling the room like some sort of merry-go-round that has no safety precautions. There are two doors on the other end of the room. Heading through the first door, we'll find a segmented hallway. In this section is a door leading to a dead end and a chest with a small key. Next, we can ride the platform and head through the other door, bringing us to the other section of that segmented hallway, which has a locked door. We can spend that key we just found and head down the this underwater tunnel, which brings us to the dungeon's mid-boss fight. The room initially seems empty, but we'll see these little frog dudes dropping down from the ceiling. And if we look up, the mid-boss will reveal itself in a moment that may be a callback to Queen Goma from Ocarina of Time. He drops from the ceiling, unleashing his little babies, and initiates the battle. This is the Deku Toad, and his design is exactly what it sounds like. The battle is pretty fun, but not a higher than average challenge. His little babies are easy enough to deal with if you spam quick spin attacks, and when he jumps into the air, just watch his shadow to avoid being dropped on. When he lands, you'll have a moment to strike his weak spot, his tongue. When he opens his mouth, you'll also have an additional chance to damage him by shooting bomb arrows directly into his mouth, which stuns him, leaving him vulnerable. Repeat this a few times, and Toady here will go down, spitting up a treasure chest before he dies. This rewards us with the dungeon item. It's the claw shot. Yes! It's no secret that I love the hookshot in almost all of its appearances, but Twilight Princess's claw shot puts the rest to shame. It retains the ability to grab and retrieve items, as well as being used for traversal, although the things it can pull you towards differ from previous hookshots. You can't stick to chests and wooden surfaces anymore, but things that the claw shot can grip are fair game. So these claw shot targets, of course, but also things like these vine walls work too. Just a small detail, but you're also able to raise and lower yourself on the chain instead of simply dropping, which is just a ton of fun. Why they got rid of this feature in Skyward Sword is just beyond me, but alas. And to make things more fun, you can also use the claw shot to remove the Helmosaurus shells, making them easier to defeat now. I love it when a dungeon item makes a once frustrating enemy a breeze to defeat. With the claw shot in hand, we are now locked in the room, forcing us to get used to to this new tool. There's some alcoves to zip up to and play around in if you want to, but otherwise we can use it on this rather obvious target in the form of this broken switch to pull down to open the gate. This brings us back to the lower section of the eastern gear room. There's some more claw shot targets to play around with in here, and we can even use it as a shortcut to get back to the door to return to the central room. I particularly like that they placed this target among the vines on the ceiling here, so that when we go to aim at the target, we'll realize that the vines are also fair game. It's a neat, subtle way to convey this to us without outright telling us. Now we can return to the central room, and we'll see that the water flow that we activated has partially raised the water level here. Next, we need to activate the water flow on the opposite side of the dungeon, but if you recall, both those doors on the western side were blocked 
blocked by water wheels. So in order to get around that, rotate the staircase in the central room, which we can now do with that broken switch here. And the staircase will act as a ramp to direct the water flow from the upper red eastern door to the lower blue western door. This causes the water wheel to turn in the lower blue hallway, so we can now pass through. We'll emerge in this western room, which, like its eastern counterpart, has several large gears with suspended platforms. We can use our new claw shot to start making our way across this room. We won't be able to reach the opposite door, but instead there are several vine walls we can claw shot over to, and we'll be able to climb to the upper floor of this room. Not unlike what we did before, we can enter the exterior hallway that loops around this interior room, knock the stalactite down, open the gate with a switch, and head into the westernmost room where we'll need to activate the water flow. There's another chew worm here, but this time, instead of bomb arrows, you can use the claw shot to just yank him out of his protective bubble and defeat him. There's no locked door this time, instead we can claw shot up to the vines on the ceiling and climb past the barrier, and we'll make our way up the spiraling ramp just like before, though this one is in far worse condition than its eastern counterpart, with huge sections of the ramp being crumbled away, forcing us to use the claw shot to pass over these gaps. At the top of the room, will activate the water flow from this side as well. Just make sure to claw shot over to this ledge here to open this chest and get yourself the compass. Now we can ride the water slide down again, Wee! open the shutter here to let the water flow down the hallways, and return to the western gear room. While we're here in the western side of the temple, you may recall that there was a door in the lower section of the room which we couldn't reach before, but now that the gears are turning, we can use the claw shot to hang from the gears and ride our way over to the door. Just a suggestion, but I recommend using your bow to get rid of the keys in here so that they don't knock you down into the abyss below. This takes us into a room that is mostly in disrepair. There's some winding underwater pathways that we can take, which will have us bomb a couple boulders, but we should be able to take the path and surface at this door. There's a small room with a chew worm and a grate on the floor. If we claw shot the switch on the ceiling, it will open the grate and we can lower ourselves into the room below, Mission Impossible style. This will bring us to a platform where we'll find the boss key. Now we can head through this door underwater and following this tunnel will loop us back into that previous room. Now it's just a matter of backtracking through the gear room, down the hallway, and back into the main central room. The water level should now be raised all the way so the boss door is accessible. Before we head through the boss door, a couple of things to note. If you're a completionist like me, there are a few extra collectible things of interest. Some are more worthwhile than others. For example, the chandelier at the top of the central room hides a treasure chest with a piece of heart. By directing the water flow into the lower eastern room, we'll also raise the water level in here, which raises the bridge, giving us access to this alcove with a second piece of heart. Both of these are worth the detail tour to get. However, in the upper easternmost room where we activated the first water flow is a chest that simply has a Miiverse stamp, which is utterly useless and a serious pain to backtrack for. Since we have to make our way up this huge spiraling ramp by either walking precariously on the ledge here or by wearing the iron boots. Ugh. There's a ton of other chests around the dungeon as well, which almost all have either cash or water bombs, so getting every single chest chest is a lot of extra effort, with not a lot of reward in my opinion. Those two heart pieces aside, that is. Ah oh well. With all of that done, we can now swim into the middle section of the central room and open up the boss door. When we enter the boss room, we'll drop down a deep pit into the water. There's nowhere to go but swim down. We'll dive into this deep abyssal chamber, and at the bottom we'll find the boss waiting for us. 
This is Morpheal, the Twilight Aquatic. During the first phase of the battle, Morpheal will stay buried in the sand, but you can use the claw shot to yank his eyeball right out and strike it with your sword. Also, make sure to stay clear of his tentacles as he'll try to grab at you and eat you. Repeat this a few times, avoiding the little water bomb fish, and we'll move on to the second phase of the battle. Morpheal will emerge from the sand and reveal himself. This is Morpheal for real, and he is massive. The visual design of Morpheal is pretty great. He's a giant aquatic eel of sorts, and he's got this big, ugly mouth thing. Of course, his eyeball is a pretty obvious weak spot, but that's beside the point because the sheer scope of this battle makes it just an incredible spectacle. And of course, size isn't everything. His design is actually threatening enough that I can take this battle seriously. Looking at you, Tintalis. A side note, but Morpheal's battle music is among my favorite boss battle themes in the game. It just captures that terrifying scale so effectively. Both in Morpheal's name and the first phase of the battle seems to be another callback to Ocarina of Time's Water Temple, particularly its boss Morpha, whose name is, well, obviously very similar, but also attacked in a similar manner. It's a neat detail, but I kind of love how they changed things up in this fight and placed the entire battle underwater like this. While he's swimming around trying to get above him to avoid being eaten, then target his eye with the claw shot and you'll get a chance to grip onto his back and attack his eyeball. This is awesome! Repeat this and he'll eventually go down. As was the case with Diababa and Phyrus, the battle itself is incredibly easy, but I still love it for the sheer, impressive scope of it and how unique it is. Hanging onto Morpheal's back like this in order to strike at him is just awesome and thrilling to do. Despite the fight being so easy, the atmosphere of this fight is phenomenal. This chamber, the low lighting, all of it just makes the battle so tense. It's perfect. Once he's defeated, he'll crash into the wall, which somehow causes the water to drain out of the room. We'll get our heart container as usual, and we'll finally have the final fused shadow. Don't worry though, there's more to come. So that's the dungeon. Overall, the lake bed temple really has an unwarranted reputation. It's known for being so confusing and brutally difficult, but if you pay attention to the water flow, the color coding, and how your actions have an effect on other rooms, then you should be able to make your way through it rather painlessly. Truth is, despite its reputation, it's one of my favorite dungeons in Twilight Princess. I feel like people say this dungeon is really complicated, but if you think of it in an objective-based way, it shouldn't be. We simply need to turn on the water Water flow from each side and collect the dungeon item and boss key along the way. And the dungeon does a pretty good job of funneling us towards the first room where we activate the water flow. It lets go with the hand holding, forcing you to really be mindful and considerate of your actions. However, it also manages to funnel you the right way by strategically blocking hallways off. Couple this cleverly designed progression structure with the claw shot, which is the hook shot at its best here, and you're in for some really fun and creative puzzle solving. Not to mention, once you get that hook shot at the dungeon's halfway point, those barriers in the central room are suddenly no longer an obstacle, since you can claw shot over them, making any frustration with the navigation in that central room no longer an issue. It suddenly opens up all the navigation options to you once you've gotten that item. It's brilliant. Brilliant. The ambience, architecture, and music here are so masterfully done. There's this really great sense of this sacred place falling into decay and disrepair that is truly palpable here. The use of colorful flagstone and overgrowth makes this place an absolute visual treat to my eyes. It's just so architecturally inspired, and I love it. And some of the more ornate elements, like these gears and water wheels, in contrast with the more temple-like elements, 
feels to me like a fusion of the Zora architecture scene in Great Bay Temple and the Water Temple from the N64 games, which is just perfect because the puzzle elements seem like the perfect combination of ideas from those temples too. And I know I said it before, but the music provides such a perfect ambient backdrop. Maybe there's just this preconceived notion about water dungeons being difficult, or maybe people just get in their own heads about it, but just as I had said about the Water Temple and Great Bay Temple, I'll die on this hill defending this dungeon. And even if you find it challenging, that doesn't mean it's badly designed. You just have to consider the cause and effect of your actions, and realize how these things impact the bigger picture of the dungeon. Truthfully, dungeons like this that are more intertwined with their puzzles, and paint a bigger picture like this, are some of my favorites. Overall, I love this place, and whenever I start a new save file of this game, it's a temple I always look forward to completing. Thank you so much for watching this video, I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me on Patreon, as well as my channel members, particularly those who supported at the cheese level or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, Grey Mage, Hylian Historian, Gale, and Ethan3G. Thank you so much for the support you guys, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye